price controls. This is something that affects you directly and you're going to write about it in your term project. Raising the minimum wage helps the poor cover their living costs. Do you agree or disagree? And what are the incentives, sacrifices, and alternatives involved? So pause here, record this slide number, write the sentence, and write your answer, whether you agree or disagree, and at least two points for each of the items. There are two types of price control. One of them is a price ceiling. The other one is a price floor. Now think about it. What is the difference between them? The ceiling is on the top, the floor is on the bottom, right? So the ceiling would be a maximum price, whereas the floor would be a minimum price. And these are things that the government imposes. So these are the laws by the government. And if somebody breaks them, they can go to jail. Okay. Now, in, in case of the price ceiling, what it means is that the sellers cannot charge more. Okay. So that's the maximum it could be. Now think about the logic. What do you think is the purpose of such a law? Why should they impose a, a maximum price that cannot be more? Well, it's, it's probably because they want to make sure that everybody can afford the product and they are not ripped off, right? So the intention is to protect the buyers so that the sellers won't abuse them, okay? And it's basically used for necessities to help the low-income households, right? Like, like what? Like rent, food, gas, and drugs, right? So things that are necessities so that everybody can, can afford them, okay? In the case of the floor, we have the, the opposite. So this is something that the buyers can't pay less of it, less on that, so you have to think about the intention here. So what what is the what is the purpose here? Why should we set a floor where the price can't go even lower than that? Well, it's probably because you wanna make sure the sellers are not abused, right? So the intention is to protect the sellers and it's applied to the markets where the sellers could be abused. Right. So we want to kind of safeguard them. So the example, the best example for that is minimum wage, where if you remember, wage is the price of labor and the workers are selling their labor. So we want to protect the laborers. OK, now something that's super important here is that when we talk about intentions, it doesn't mean that those intentions are actually met. OK, as it's going to turn out. The path to hell is good intentions, right? So we're going to see that these are the, the rationale that's given for them, but a lot of times they defeat their purpose. Okay, so pause here, record the slide number, write a one sentence summary of this slide and some notes for yourself using your own words. This is amazing lesson from history. Germany, 1945. They've lost the war. They're in a mess. There is a low supply of food. Now, what is it called when there is low supply and a lot of demand? A shortage, right? So one thing that was going on at the time was price ceiling, which means artificially low food prices, right? And this had started actually before the war by Hitler um, because they were buying food and it was in their interest of the of the party to do that. And also during the war because of the shortages, right? Now, the, the ironic thing is that the Allies actually confirmed that, right? So they kept the price ceilings. Well, um, Roosevelt had died before Hitler, but so you can say Truman. But anyway, something, let me open a bracket here. When it comes to the world of politics, there are a lot of similar incentives. Even when politicians fight each other and oppose each other, their incentives are a lot of times very comparable. Okay, and this is, this is something to, to note. Also, uh, you have to kind of be careful. There's a lot of rhetoric that, okay, you guys are bad as if we are good. Well, if we look a bit deeper, we are all motivated by very similar incentives. So instead of playing the blame game, it's better to be a bit more self-critical. Anyway, closing the bracket, let's look at the, the price ceiling in general, not just in Germany, but always what happens because of a price ceiling, right? So first of all, in this context, think of the farmers. The price of food is artificially kept low. If you're a farmer and if you're not getting enough money for your products, how are you going to feel? And what happens to your incentives? Are you going to have incentive to expand your production, to increase your quantity and quality? Are you going to have incentive to be competitive? Well, the incentives of the farmers and food producers would go down. And now we have a shortage. So shortage means not enough, right? So there's not enough food. So who is going to get it? There's a lot of buyers, but not enough food. Who is going to get it? Well, the, the, the buyers are going to compete or fight among each other. And the ones who are more powerful are going to get it, right? So the buyers with connections get the food and the weaker ones starve. So notice how this policy starts 
defeating its purpose. The purpose was to was to defend the, the weak, but what happens is that because of the dynamics and the incentives involved, it actually harms the weak. All right. So the consumers would have paid more, right? But be, but the price is artificially kept low, right? And if the if the buyers were to pay more, what would happen to the incentives of the farmers? Well, the farmers would have incentive to grow more, right? Oh, that's so cool, right? So the producers would have supplied more and that would have solved the problem, right? So you can see how distorting these things can harm everyone. And the result of that is black market. So there was huge black market in Germany and it also always creates black market whenever something is artificially um, kept to low or high, okay? So the sellers have an advantage position. So think of it like this. Imagine a shopper who has very limited supply but who has a lot of buyers. What's gonna be their incentives? First of all, they have a power because they have limited amount and they have a lot of buyers. So what, what they could do is they could discriminate, right? So they can say, hey, I don't, I don't like your face, I don't like your race, you go away, because they have, they have just a little amount of uh, supply and they can simply discriminate among the, among the uh, buyers. So here again, you can see how the, this policy can, can increase unfairness, right? Can increase the gaps between the population. Also, there, there is no incentive to maintain a high, high quality or high service, right? Because there are a lot of buyers. So if somebody doesn't like you, it will go to hell, right? So the quality also drops. Now, the good news is in 1948, the price controls were repealed. And that was by a very amazing economist who was in charge of the economic uh, system of the Bizonal uh, Council in Germany. His name was Ludwig Erhardt. So I wanna, and, and later on he became a chancellor. So I, I like to actually point out politicians who are actually good because most of the time politicians don't make economically sound decisions. But this guy was actually an exception. He was an anti-Nazi during Hitler's regime also. Uh, amazing job, he just, he just take, took off the, the price controls. And what happened is that food became abundant and all of the black market just vanished, right? Because if you can sell food legally at a, at a reasonable price, why should you go to the black market? And the buyers also, right? So a very simple solution: just take off the take off the price ceiling, and and that solved the problem. This is called the German economic miracle. It was really a miracle, um, and it helped Germany recover very quickly. So pause here, write the slide number and a one sentence summary in your own words and some notes. I really want you to understand the logic behind price controls. So imagine a pharmaceutical drug. And prior to any price control, the market price of the drug is $100, right? Now, if there is no price control, what is the ceiling? What is the maximum possible price for this? It's anything, right? It's infinite. It could be as high as it may be, right? And what is the floor? What is the minimum price that it could have? Well, the minimum price of anything is zero, right? So literally, the price could be anywhere. What determines the price is the interaction of the buyers and the sellers, depending on the willingness to pay of the buyers and the cost of the sellers. That would determine the price, right? Now, so there's no restriction, so the market price could be anywhere. The government comes in and says, hang on, to ensure that all patients can have the drug, we'll lower the price below $100, right? So the thing here is the price is going to decrease. Right, so they're gonna push down the price and the objective here is to, the objective is good, right? It's a good intention. We wanna make sure that everyone, the poor people, everyone can afford the, the medicine. But let's see what happens. What happens to the market? What happens to the incentives of the buyers and the sellers? Lowering the, the ceiling to an artificially lower level is gonna result in more buyers. Remember the law of demand, right? So because, because the price is lower, now more people are gonna be willing to buy and fewer sellers, right? Because the price is lower, again, you have the law of supply. So what happens is you're gonna get lower uh, quantity supply and higher quantity demanded. And what is it called when you have a lot of buyers and few sellers? That is called a shortage, right? So this price ceiling, like any price ceiling, is gonna create a shortage. And notice that it really defeats its, pur its purpose, right? The idea was that all patients can have the drug, right? Now, can all the patients have the drug when there is a shortage? Mm, no, right? So pause here, uh, write the slide number, one sentence summary in your own words and some notes. Let's see how we can show a price ceiling using a graph. If you remember in our example, we had 
the price of drug was $100 and the government said, hey, we're going to reduce it so that everybody can, everybody can afford it. So we're going to have a drug market, which looks like any other market with supply and demand and the equilibrium in the middle. So the PE would be the, the market price without any government restriction. Okay. Now the logic here is we want to make sure that everybody can afford it. So we're going to lower the price. Okay. So we're going to draw a line here, which is going to be the new ceiling. That is a binding price ceiling, right? So it's an artificially price, which is, which is kept low, right? So usually the ceiling should be very high, but the government comes and pushes it down, right? We want to see what happens here. Now notice, look at the purple line, the P1 line. There are two intersections on it, right? So we're going to get rid of the mess here in the middle and we get the two points. Now these two points are kind of important. The first intersection, as you can see, is the intersection with the supply right so that point is going to give us the quantity supplied and the second intersection is the intersection with demand and that's, that's going to give us the quantity demanded now remember this is really just reflecting the laws of supply and demand the first one qs1 is really low why because that's the law of supply when the price is lower there's less that's going to be supplied the second one is really high because that's the law of demand right so let's get rid of the mess uh, at P1, the quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded, which means a shortage, okay? So you can easily show a shortage in a graph, as you see here, the distance between the two points, right? So if you're told to show a shortage in a graph, that's how you show it. It's as simple as that. And the result is the government coercion results in lower production and lower consumption because what, what you get is that the production level drops to quantity supplied one, Right? So because there is no more incentives to, to produce, that's going to result in lower production and also lower consumption. So pause here, record this slide number, do a graph for yourself and some notes. Wow, that was cool. All right, the same analysis can be applied to a price floor. Remember, a price floor is like a minimum wage. So before any price control, the wage rate is $10 per hour, for instance. Okay, so we want to see what happens. If there is no price control, what it means is that the ceiling or the upper limit is this guy and the floor or the lower limit is zero. Oh, that's scary. All right, so what it means is that the market price can be anywhere. The wage rate could be anywhere. Now the government comes in and says, hang on, that's not fair. To ensure the workers are adequately paid will force a minimum wage above the market price. So we are going to raise the wage rate and we're going to enforce it, right? So it's not your choice anymore. So what that means is that the price would go up. Just a couple of important notes here. Workers are the sellers of labor and the minimum wage would be a lower bound. That would be a price floor. That's how you have to think about these things, right? So think about the logic involved and the incentives here. If the price of anything goes up, what happens to the buyers? Well, raising the price floor means some artificial high level. As a result of that, there's gonna be fewer buyers what happens to the number of sellers if the price is higher? If they can sell at a higher price, there will be more incentive for them, right? So the quantity of demand is going to fall because of the law of demand, and the quantity of supply is going to increase because of the law of supply. Now, what is it called when you have very few buyers but a lot of sellers? A surplus, right? And a surplus of labor is when a lot of people want to work, but nobody wants to hire them, which is called unemployment. Okay, so that's the result and that really defeats the purpose because now they don't even have a job to be paid for. Okay, so record this slide number, a one sentence summary and some notes. The case of a price floor is very similar on a graph as you saw with the ceiling. So we saw that for instance in the minimum wage the price is set above the market equilibrium. All right, so we're going to have the labor market which again looks like any other market. We have W, which stands for wage, right? So it's just a price. And the WE is our market equilibrium price, right? So without any government restriction. Now the government comes in and says, hang on, we want to protect the workers. So we are going to set the price higher, right? So that's going to be the minimum wage. And that would be a binding price floor. Now remember again, the floor should usually be low. That, that's, what, that's the whole point of it. But a government policy is an artificially higher price. Okay, so again, what we have is we have two points of intersection on the demand curve and the supply curve, and we're going to see the corresponding quantities, right? So the point on the demand curve will give us quantity demanded here, right? And the point on the supply curve will give us the 
quantity supply. Okay, so what we have is let's get rid of the mess. At W3, the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. And what is it called when you have more suppliers than buyers? That would be a surplus, right? And how do you show it in a graph? Well, that's simple. You just find the distance between the two points, and that would be your surplus. So if you're told to show a surplus in a graph, that's how you would show it. And by the way, unemployment is a surplus of labor. So that would be also a diagram for unemployment. If you want to show unemployment in a graph, this is what you can show. All right. The result is government coercion will lead to fewer jobs and higher prices. Okay. And that's something that, that I want to emphasize because it's, it's important. So, so think of the, the intention, think of the purpose, right? So they fail once again. Go. Um, so pause here, record this slide number and do a graph for yourself and some notes. This is an important slide. I really want you guys to understand how the minimum wage works, right? So the purpose is to protect the poor and the unskilled workers. And we said that it doesn't work. So we want to see why it doesn't work. So first of all, I want, I want to have a little review here. Who are the suppliers of labor and who are the demanders of labor? So when you take your notes, you must write that down. And if you don't remember, just either think about it because it's quite logical or refer back to your notes from the market. And the wage is the price of, so you fill in the blank, the price floor means forcing employers to pay workers more than their productivity, right? Because their productivity is determined in the market, but then they're forced to pay more. And then the incentives of firms to hire will go down because the price is higher. The cost of them is going to be higher. Now, here's the thing. Imagine this. There are a lot of applicants and there are not enough jobs, right? So who's going to get the jobs? Well, just like always, the ones who are more powerful, right? So what happens is that the applicants with connections get the positions and the less privileged will starve. So the purpose was to actually help the less privileged. But what happens is that because of the dynamics of the market, it's, gonna, it's just going to distort the incentives of everyone. All right. So the employers have an advantage position here because they have one spot, let's say, for a job, and they have 100 applicants for that one spot. So what they can do is that they can easily discriminate. And what we see is that the minorities, the visible minorities and single mothers, those are the ones who, who get the hit because they're, they're, they're usually not in, in a good position to, to be qualified for, for, a, for a job when there are 100 other applicants. And they're the ones who, who need the most. Okay? So a lot of the racial, uh, the, the racism that we see are, are, result, it's, are, are results of price controls like the minimum wage, especially in the U.S., the, the black unemployment rate increased a lot because of the minimum wage in the 50s and 60s, okay? Uh, there are more duties that are assigned to those hired, right? So because the, the think again, thinking about, think about the incentives of the employer. They're like, hey man, this is a ripoff. I have to pay more. So you know what? I'm going to make these people work more in one way or another. Maybe the quality of the work, the quantity of it, the hours of it somehow, right? So, so they're going to retaliate in one way or another. One, one way of retaliation is benefits. So for instance, less vacation, uh, sick leaves, insurance, right? So when you take notes, I put three dots there so that you, you add at least a couple more benefits. Maybe think of your own job or things that you know or heard of. So the idea is that the cost that's imposed on the employers, that cost is actually handed down to the, to the employees, right? So the purpose was to protect the employees, but you know, it, it actually ends up hurting them. The firms become less competitive, right? So the idea is that they have they have a lot of applicants. So why should they why should they be you know competitive in in terms of the the jobs that they offer? Um, yeah, there we go. So the minimum wage is is missing a lot of ranks. Also, there's gonna be higher price of products for the consumer. So living cost goes up. This is really important because a lot of people who buy, let's say at McDonald's or Dollarama or Walmart, for instance, those are the companies who hire uh, minimum wage workers. A lot of their customers are also poor people. Now the cost of living for them also goes up. The teenagers can't gain work experience and that means less human capital, which is not good for the society. So you can see the minimum wage really doesn't have any benefit except for who? Except for those who have the connections, except for those who have the advantages, right? So the advantage become even more advantage. The privilege become more 
privileged, right? That's really the result of it. And that's, that's, that's what's driving it, actually. Those are the ones who have the power. Those, those are the ones who enforce these kinds of laws. So you have to be very, very sensitive and skeptical about these laws. Something that I also want to emphasize here is this, is this idea of productivity. Um, it, that's what determines the actual or the right amount of wage, but the government doesn't know the productivity of the workers, okay? So the minimum wage really becomes a pacifier to win elections uh, because it kind of sounds good, it, it, it has a good intention, but a lot of people are not aware of, of, the, of the adverse effect, effects that it has. So pause here, if you want, watch this slide one more time, write a one sentence summary and some notes and make sure you fill in all of the blanks, all right? Let's wrap up a bit. So the government solutions that we talked about, what are the results of it? Well, they, they transfer competition from one place to another. So instead of competing in the market, now people start competing to win the government's resources and decisions so that it favors them particularly, right? The privileged get even more privileged because of the dynamics of the competition and the shortage or surplus created. Okay, and that artificial shortage or surplus is going to result in destructive competition. So destructive is the idea that the privilege become more, more privileged and the resources are not being directed in their best use. Okay, the true value of anything depends on two main components. One of them is the cost of the produ producers and the other is the preferences of the cons consumers. This kind of information is not available to anyone. Right? This kind of information is dispersed among the society. It's unknown to the government. So even if they want to set a minimum or, or maximum for something, how do they know what is the proper minimum or the proper maximum? If you want to have a, have a minimum wage, who said it should be $15 and not $20? And why not $25? And why not $200? If it's about helping the poor, let's, let's set it at $200. It's ridiculous. You're going to see that it's all arbitrary. Okay. So the best way is to let, let the producers and consumers by their interaction determine what is what is in their best interest. There is going to be market distortion and that creates inefficiency and inefficiency means wastefulness when the resources are not used properly. The government regulations reduce efficiency, limit our liberty and do not achieve their intended objectives. Okay, so these are these are important results of government intervention, especially in the context of um, price controls. Okay, so pause here, record this slide number and some notes in your own words. Now, if you're a good economist, you would be very sensitive about alternatives. Given that the government price controls don't work, that's not enough. You should see if there are any better alternatives. And actually there is. So that would be the voluntary cooperation of buyers and sellers in a free market. And that kind of competition will result in lower price for the end users better quality because of the competition, more production, so more output, and no coercion. So there is no government forcing people to do what, right? That would be constructive competition. And obviously voluntary cooperation, that's really the idea of the market. So the market mechanism is a voluntary cooperation of the buyers and the sellers, okay? Now, that would respect the incentives. How about helping the poor? One option is the negative income tax. So the idea of a negative income tax is very, very straightforward. If people earn below a certain level, which is needed to live, they receive money from the government, okay? Now, the, the advantage of, of, of this is that this is going to supplement the wages. It's not like replacing it. It doesn't raise the output prices, so it's not in, in enforced on the, on the firms. And it actually gives an incentive to work and prosper because the net benefit of the people will actually increase if they work and prosper. And it reaches a target group, so there is no leakage it's very easy to administer. Okay, so this is just one option that can be used uh, when, um, as, as opposed to, for instance, a minimum wage. Okay, so pause here, uh, record the slide number, write a one sentence summary in your own words and some notes. Wow, that was cool. All right, there's a notion that automation kills jobs and we wanna see how it works. So first of all, have you ever heard of the telegram or the traditional mail? Right? There were a lot of people who were employed by these services. With the advent of email on cell phones, many jobs were lost and some new jobs were created. Or you can take the example of carriages and rickshaws. With new transportation, again, many jobs were lost and new jobs were created. Or take the example of manual labor, like cleaning. With, with new technology, many jobs again were lost and new jobs were created. 
So here's my question to you. Imagine yourself in with, with, with the two options. You could live in the, in the old system where there were a lot of jobs and you could live in the new system where there are other types of jobs. Which one would you prefer? Where do you think life is more convenient? And where do you think jobs are better? So what I want you to do is write another example of your own of something that has changed. So think of some technology that has changed the, the labor market um, for yourself that would help you. And then later we're going to give you some more notes. So the question is, is technology labor saving or labor augmenting? Now, there are two aspects to it. First of all, there are some jobs lost, and that should be admitted. What kind of job is lost because of technology? Usually, these are unskilled, manual, unpleasant, and low-pay jobs. Okay. Also, it's only temporary in the short run because those, oh, that's cool, because those workers are to be retrained, and then they're going to be reabsorbed in the labor market. Okay. What kind of jobs are created? These are usually jobs that have higher skills, so we're going to have a more specialized labor force and that's going to result in higher pay for them, okay? Because pay is a function of productivity. So we're going to have more productivity because of technology, okay? Also, the results of technology would include lower cost of living for consumers and also more convenience because of the products like vacuum cleaners and so forth. There's going to be more competitive industry. And overall, there's going to be higher standard of living for everyone and more efficiency. All right, so pause here, uh, record the slide number, one sentence summary, and some notes. Price controls include price ceiling and price floor, which lead to shortage and surplus. Some other consequences of them are, that's so cool. All right, now we don't like this. We are like, what have you done? Well, our alternative to that is the free market, which does a better job at serving these. And it also promotes technology. Technology in the short run is labor saving. In the long run, it's labor augmenting, so it creates more jobs. It also raises our standard of living, which is our comfort, and it raises our human capital. Some, co some concepts here are things that you've seen before, like shortage, surplus, efficiency. Some other things you're going to see later, like standard of living. Um, the two concepts that I would emphasize for this lesson are price ceiling and price floor. Make sure you know what they are. So pause here, draw a concept map for yourself. What I would suggest is uh, try to do your own. If you like to use mine as a template, make at least three changes to it. So there are a, a number of concepts that, that don't, don't show here, but they were covered in the lesson, so you can add them. Or you can rearrange the, rearrange the lines if you want. That, that would help you. It's also a good idea to write some examples of each concept for yourself, not in the concept map, but just for yourself. That would help your learning. All right. So pause here before you move on. Pause here and answer again the question that you received at the beginning of the lesson. So write at least two items for each of the three questions, and then I'm going to show you a sample of a student answer. So for minimum wage, two incentives could be helping the disadvantaged and reducing the income gaps. What is being sacrificed could be freedom to accept a lower pay if somebody wants that, and affordable final products. What alternatives there are, well, we can let the supply and demand of labor determine the wage rate, and we can have no discrimination, which is going to be more equitable society. Okay, have a great day.